yeah yeah over over to you thank you uh thanks ajay and uh, good morning uh, to you all uh first and foremost i would sort of like uh, to thank manthan for having me over and uh, you know the fact that we're doing this digitally tells us that manthan is in tune with uh, the times that we are in and uh, you know even uh, something as big as covid 19 is hasn't uh, stopped them from uh, continuing with their mission mission in you know so uh, normally you know this is not how sunday mornings are uh, not for all of us in fact i was talking to a friend before uh, you know before this and uh, he was like uh, you know he didn't even realize that today is a sunday so that that's how things have been for a while uh, having said that uh, you know uh, i i just wanted to start with a couple of uh, disclaimers uh the the first thing that i'd like to say is that uh, if you've sort of been reading my columns uh, regularly over the last uh, few weeks uh, you would know as to what i broadly think about uh, uh the negative impact of uh, covid-19 uh so much of what i say will obviously uh, be borrowed from my columns but you know the 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 difference obviously will be that uh, uh, a column ends uh, in 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 1100 words at best and you really don't get uh, a complete picture so this talk will essentially give you a complete picture of how i see uh, the negative repercussions of uh, covid-19 uh, spreading in 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 the next uh, few months or over the course of uh, the remaining part of this year uh the second disclaimer that i'd like to uh, make is uh, you know what what has happened and this is uh, this is a disclaimer i sort of try and give at the beginning of all my all my talks now what is what has happened with the subject of uh, economics uh, in 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 the last uh, i guess uh, uh, 75 years uh, after the second world war is that it's become very mathematical and uh, to that sense there is a feeling that economics is a science i mean it's it, but i don't think economics is a science it's it's uh, partly maths and 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 a lot of uh, other things uh, so to sort of uh, give you a reference straight out of hindi cinema uh, a few years back there was this uh, movie called zindagi na milegi dobara uh, directed by uh, zoya akhtar and in that uh, there is a line which uh, nasruddin shah's character you know by far one of the best guest appearances in hindi cinema uh, asks farhan akhtar's character rather uh, rhetorically that sach kya hota hai and then goes on to answer uh, by saying that uh, sabka apna apna ek version hota hai so which basically means you know what is truth everybody has got their own version so what uh, you are about to hear for the next uh, 40 45 minutes is is my version of uh, what i think uh, is going to be true now whether i am right or whether i i'll be wrong i mean that only time will tell uh, because we are in totally uh, uncharted uh, territory here uh, so i would like to sort of start this uh, this 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 talk with uh, john minard keynes uh, john minard keynes was a british economist uh, who uh, probably the most famous economist of the 20th century who died in 1946 at the age of 62 uh, both his parents outlived him and uh, he was famously gay during his uh, younger years and then married a russian uh, ballet dancer called lydia lopakova uh, lady keens as she eventually uh, came to be known obviously outlived her husband as well and uh, she was alive as uh, late as 1988 now uh, i mean obviously these are not the things which make keynes famous uh, what makes him famous among his many writings uh, is uh, his magnum opus uh, called the general theory of employment interest and money which was published in 1936 now in this book uh, keynes essentially tries or rather tried to understand the reasons uh, behind the great depression of 1929 and why was it as bad as it uh, turned out to be uh so he came up with uh, a very basic concept which i would like to start with uh, before i get into any more details uh, what what he said was that income uh, you know rather spending at uh, an individual level i mean any you know spending that you and i do uh in order to live our lives the way we do 
So spending at an individual level is basically a function of income, you know, the money you and I make. Uh, whereas spending at a societal level, rather income at a societal level is a function of uh, spending. Now, uh, to put it in, in, in simple English, uh, what Keynes meant was one man's spending is another man's income. So uh, let's say, you know, you, you have a job, right? And your company uh, pays you a salary every month. Now, uh, the money that you make uh, is your major form of income and that money you essentially spend on goods and services that you need to lead your life well or even on goods and services you don't need. Uh, because that is how consumerism actually works. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, you spend from the income that you earn. So at an individual level, uh, spending is a function of income. Now, but the question to actually ask here is, where does the company get the money from to pay you? Now, every company obviously is in some business and, you know, it, it sells some goods, it manufactures some goods or it offers some services uh, for which people pay. So actually they spend money. When they spend money, the company earns money. And out of that money, the company pays you something and that is your income. So at an aggregate level, uh, you know, uh, spending determines income, whereas at an individual level, income determines spending. So this is a, one of the, you know, the most basic points in economics that I guess all of us uh, need to understand. Now, the question here is, the question here is, uh, you know, why have I sort of started uh, on a Sunday morning with an old British economist and what he had to write way back in 1936, right? Uh, so how is this connected to the topic at hand? Now, uh, I mean, I don't know if you, if you guys have realized this, but many businesses, you know, be it malls, cinemas, automobile companies, hotels, airlines, electronic uh, retailers, other retailers, publishing companies, bookstores, uh, real estate companies, online platforms, and even restaurants are going to earn zero sales revenue during April. And if not zero, very close to zero. Uh, the same also stands true for many small businesses in your area, right? I mean, people who run tailoring shops, I mean, the few tailoring shops that are around dry cleaners, wine shop owners to some extent, uh, not all of them, I guess, uh, shops selling ready-made clothes, barbers, pan and cigarette vendors, etc. Now, the point is that because they are shut, uh, there's no way you can buy you know, the goods and services they have to offer. So there is no spending <clears throat> at an aggregate level and hence there's no income for them. Now, uh, this basically drives us to another fundamental point that Keynes made and, uh, you know, and, and what economists uh, like to call uh, the fallacy of composition. You know, the problem with economists is they like to give complicated terms to what are essentially simple concepts uh, to basically, you know, make the whole thing sound very, very esoteric than it actually is. So what is uh, a fallacy of composition? The fallacy of composition basically states that what's good for an individual may not be good for the society as a whole. So uh, to give you an example, if you decide to start saving money, right? I mean, you are, let's say you are, you are, you know, you've not been saving money and now you decide, okay, I need to start saving money. So uh, it makes perfect sense for you because few months down the line, you would have uh, sort of ended up accumulating a nice little kitty, which you can access when, you know, times are not so good, right? Uh, so saving at an individual level makes uh, immense sense. But if many individuals start saving more, uh, then, uh, you know, there is a problem. It's, it's, it's not good news. Uh, it's not always good news for the economy. Because when people save more, they spend less. And when they spend less, as I said, incomes of others go down. So how is all this, uh, you know, linked to the current scenario, uh, which is basically a lockdown that we are in. We, we, we are in. Now, uh, so what has been happening is that, uh, you know, given that all of us uh, are, uh, are, are, are at home, uh, we've, we've been spending very little money. We've basically been spending money only on uh, our things that we uh, need to live our everyday lives or what economists again like to call non-discretionary expenditure. 
uh so in so because we were sort of uh, you know spending money on only the most essential things and even if we want to spend money on non essential things there's no way we can really go about it uh incomes of many businesses have taken a beating uh and uh, you know honestly there is very little chance of them being able to recover this <clears throat> income in the days to come now when incomes take a beating as 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 uh, you know because at an individual level income determines spending spending take a beating as well and when spending takes a beating at an aggregate level uh incomes again turn a beat take a beating and then spending take a beating again and you know this is how the cycle uh plays out also uh you know uh, even if let's say the lockdown ends on may 4th uh, i don't think uh, you know people are suddenly going to stop practicing uh, social distancing and because of that many service oriented businesses uh, will get impacted now i don't know how many of you've got this forward but there's this forward going around about how dangerous it is to visit a barber shop now i'm really not uh, you know sure about the science behind it but the larger point is that it obviously puts uh, the fear of visiting a barber shop in people's uh, minds uh, the other great example here <clears throat> is that of cinema halls or or rather that of cinema now sweden is one country which hasn't really gone in for a lockdown and their cinemas continue to be operational and from what i have been able to gather uh, the the uh, you know not many people are actually uh, visiting cinema halls as of now in fact uh, a few days back i was uh, reading an interview of one of the producers of uh, this big release called suryavanshi which was scheduled on march 24th and was eventually postponed and from what i could gather from the interview is that uh, you know none of the producers of you know all the big films that were scheduled to be released you know including suryavanshi and then uh, there was 1983 are in a hurry to release their movies so they are actually going to sort of wait it out and see as to how soon people go back to cinemas and only then decide uh, you know when to release their movie so uh, so from what i remember reading in this this article uh, and what the gentleman was basically saying that uh, was that big films will only come back around 6 months uh, down the line so there is a you know so there there's a problem there now obviously you know some of the consequences of incomes of business going down will be employees being laid off uh, has already started across large parts of the world uh, even in india uh and particularly in the informal sector which is basically you know uh, the largest employer uh, put on leave without pay many companies have already done this uh, airlines are a very good example in india salary cuts uh, has happened all across uh, the media uh, postponement of date of joining of new hires many banks are doing it no fresh recruitment all over the place no increments this year all over the place uh so obviously again you know incomes will get impacted spendings will get impacted incomes will get impacted again and so the story will go now you know uh, what's interesting is that uh, you know more than getting fired what impacts the economy is the fear of getting fired or what i would like to call you know the psychology of a slowdown or a psychology of a recession uh, you know depending on how badly we end up Uh, because of covid-19 now uh, the, f- the the first round of firing creates or rather will create a fear of losing one's job and that uh, will have a larger impact on the economy than the firings per se now i would like to take an example or rather go back to the great depression of 1929 and this is an example i have used often so if if you sort if you follow me regularly you know i'm sorry i'm repeating this example but uh, it just fits in beautifully with what i've been what you know what i'm trying to say here so in in 19 uh, in you know uh, once the great depression of 1929 started and uh, in fact economists are still arguing about uh, you know what led to the start of the great depression uh, you know i essentially believe <clears throat> and i came to this conclusion while uh, writing my easy money books was the great depression of 1929 essentially started uh, in october 1929 when uh, i mean obviously you know the great depression of 1929 has to start in 1929 so that is a little you know it's slightly tautological uh, uh, so it started when uh, the stock markets uh, rather the stock market in new york started the new york stock exchange started to fall in october 1929 and because people were heavily leveraged a lot of lot of investors lost their shirt 
and then in order to sort of recover some of their losses they started you know selling their holdings in the commodity markets and then the commodity market started to fall and uh, people started losing you know so basically people started losing jobs all over the place uh, uh, between 1929 and 1933 four years later the unemployment in the us uh, rose to 25% uh, nearly uh, 13 million americans were unemployed uh, but this had a disproportionate impact on uh, uh, on the cut down in consumer spending now uh, if if you look at ford motor company which was the biggest motor company in in the us at that point of time their sales collapsed by 86% between 1929 and 1933 which was huge so what really was happening there what was happening was that you know even people who had not last lost their jobs cut down on their consumption and the reason for that was very very simple it, it was the fact that because 25% of the workforce was unemployed everybody knew someone else who was unemployed and uh, the fear of getting unemployed and not finding a job uh, all over again was so huge that people started you know cutting down on their consumption and saving for the rainy day uh so as you know as as robert schiller uh, who is a nobel prize winning economist uh, uh, writes in this uh, uh, book called narrative economics those who already owned a car decided to keep the car going rather longer those who did not own a car decided to continue taking public transportation uh so some people postponed buying a car or other major consumer items which led to loss of jobs in the auto and consumer product industries which led to more postponement which led to a second round of job loss and so you know the things were so a similar sort of dynamic is uh, about to play out in india in fact it was you know even before covid-19 struck uh, given the fact that the indian economy was not in great shape Uh, has not been in great shape for now you know at, at least you know 2 to 3 years uh, uh, this dynamic was already working uh, at at some level and now it will become even more stronger uh, so to give you give you uh, you know to throw some numbers at you uh, the the center for monitoring indian economy uh, has essentially if you look at their data uh, as of april 12 uh, the unemployment in the country stood at 24% so we are already there uh, you know one in four indians around one in four indians is unemployed uh, we are already there uh, at uh, you know at at the level of great depression uh, the rate of unemployment as of march 22nd 20 days earlier uh, was 8.4% now the 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 thing here which is now uh, you know the media has talked about uh, this over the last 10 days about uh, the very high rate of unemployment but what they haven't talked about and this makes the thing even more interesting is uh, something called uh, the labor force participation rate uh, which has fallen dramatically from around 42.6% as of march 22nd to around 35.5% as of uh, april 12 what does it mean it basically means that people have stopped looking for jobs many people have stopped looking looking for jobs and hence uh, the 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 total number of people in the in the workforce has come down and within that you know the lesser workforce few uh, more people are unemployed uh so nearly one in four and that makes the situation even more dangerous so technically the rate of unemployment is actually more than 24% but given the fact that people who stop looking for jobs do not get counted as unemployed uh you know the rate of unemployment is at 24% now the point here is that nearly one in four indians is unemployed at a point of time i know at you know which can't be good news uh, also this is uh, you know peak uh, rabi har- harvesting season Uh, with the country expected to produce around 130 million tons of wheat chana uh, mustard etc the trouble is there aren't enough uh, laborers going around uh, to harvest this crop uh, so what what happens is you know india has a fairly migrant labor population unlike china where you know you're not allowed to move uh, and a lot of this migrant labor uh, works in cities and then goes back uh, to Uh, to the villages to help uh, during the harvesting season now uh, uh, many such people are stuck in cities uh, also you know uh, over the last few days if you've been in bombay there have uh, there are there are a lot of these uh, sos kind of whatsapp forwards going around asking people to buy 
you know, stuff like grapes and mangoes directly from farmers, you know, in places like Nashik and all around the Konkan and help them earn some money. Now, the supply chains have essentially collapsed and there is no way for, uh, you know, what is being produced to reach uh, the end customer. Uh, so clearly there, there's, 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 there's a problem with the Indian economy. And you know, if you've been following uh, many economists, uh, so you know, economists have essentially been given, being, you know, giving this growth, very precise growth forecasts. Now, which is something, uh, you know, I find very problematic because, you know, we, we are really not in a situation wherein, uh, we, wherein we know very, very clearly as to how badly this will play out. Uh, so all you can do is essentially, you know, some rough uh, back of the envelope uh, calculations. And uh, so if, you know, the way I look at it is uh, with the economy being, you know, with, with, with the country under a lo lockdown from April 1st to May 4th, uh, what that basically means is that uh, a large uh, part of the economy will not work for around five weeks, at least five weeks uh, during the course of this uh, financial year. Uh, also, you know, uh, uh, a lot of this, uh, you know, even if we open up May 5th onwards, uh, a lot of businesses will not uh, recover very, very quickly. So roughly, you can, you know, roughly you can say that around 8 to 10% of the economic activity uh, for 2020-21 is likely to be impacted. Uh, the thing that one can say with a little more confidence or actually a lot more confidence is that India will enter uh, into a recession this year. Uh, a recession is essentially uh, defined as a situation where an economy contracts in size for two consecutive quarters. So basically for a period of six months. Uh, so April to June 2020 is, I mean, given the fact that uh, the economy has been, will be under a shutdown for almost five weeks. So it, it will contract. I mean, that that is basically a no-brainer. And I think uh, there will be a spillover effect uh, for July to September as well. Uh, things will improve uh, between October and December. Uh, you know, obviously, this is as all this is assuming that there are, you know, the lockdown doesn't get extended. Uh, and things will improve October to December also because that's the uh, festival season and people do, uh, you know, sort of like to spend money at that point of time. Uh, so the point uh, is, the point is, if I were to sort of summarize this in, in, in one line, the psychology of, of a recession is now more or less in place. And that will, uh, you know, that will hurt us quite a lot. Now, uh, you know, let's, let's look at some economic indicators uh, for the month of March. Now, what I'm trying to do here is uh, just to explain as to how interconnected any economy is. And because the economy is interconnected, you know, how things move from uh, one part of the economy to, to, to another part. Uh, uh, and this is very important to understand. Uh, so, so look at March, you know, domestic car sales fell by around 53.3%. Uh, March 2020, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, March 2019. Two-wheeler sales fell by around 40%. And commercial vehicle sales crashed by a whopping 88%. Now, of course, uh, you know, uh, we all know that no automobile company makes everything on its own. So if car sales were to come down, they would impact, uh, you know, sales of uh, companies which make tires, companies which make steel, car steerings, rubber, so on and so forth. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, uh, but, you know, it will basically go down the value chain. Also, steel companies will have to stop uh, tem temporarily stop production, primarily because they will run out of space where they can, uh, you know, store the steel that they have manufactured. And uh, other, you know, other industries are also going to face similar problems. Also, you know, it's not from from what I understand, it's not, you know, uh, you can't like switch on and switch off a steel plant. So it takes time to, you know, get back into activity. Uh, what will happen because of uh, all this is uh, power consumption will come down. Now, you know, you might come around and tell me, but that's a good thing given the fact that, you know, a large proportion of, uh, uh, of power in India is, you know, uh, produced by burning coal. So, you know, it, it, it sort of improves our uh, pollution numbers. But what we need to understand, and, you know, the power consumption in March fell by around 9.2%. But what we need to understand here is, and so this is where, you know, the links become very, very interesting, 
is the fact that in large parts of the country, industrial users of power subsidize domestic users. And when industrial users cut down on their power consumption, the state electricity boards or the power distribution companies end up making losses. When they end up making losses, power distribution companies do not produce do not pay what they owe to power producing companies. Uh, the problem is power producing companies are heavily leveraged. They have taken on a lot of loans from banks over the last decade. So if they don't get paid, they don't pay in the end, uh, you know, uh, end up servicing uh, bank loans. So then banks are in a problem. So this is how, you know, a crisis uh, spreads and this is how you know, you understand that any economy doesn't operate in isolation. And, uh, you know, to sort of slightly deviate here, so this this sort of makes me go uh, to the loan moratorium, wherein, you know, everyone was like, uh, people were surprised that they would have to pay interest on the loan uh, for a period of three months if they took on a moratorium. I mean, boss, if you don't pay interest on your loan, how will the bank pay interest on your fixed deposit? So, I mean, it's as simple as that. So you cannot really shut down one part of the economy and, you know, hope that everything else will fall into place. I mean, there will be repercussions, there will be impacts in other parts of the economy. Now, getting back to the point on power, uh, in fact, the government has already given power distribution companies a moratorium of three months uh, when it comes to making payments to power generating companies. And uh, Urjit Patel, the former RBI governor, had a very interesting thing to say on this in a column that he recently wrote in the Indian Express, where he, he says, and I quote, a payments moratorium on power suppliers by government-owned electricity distributors, if media reports are correct, is a sub-sovereign default. And I agree. Of course, and a moratorium doesn't solve anything. I mean, it essentially basically postpones a problem and, you know, you're, essent you're hoping that uh, you know, once time has elapsed, things will automatically fall into place. But you know, whether that happens, time will tell. The other example that I would like to give here, and I mean, I wrote a rather long piece on this uh, for News Laundry. Uh, you guys might want to check that out. Uh, you know, uh, when it comes to new home sales, uh, new home sales weren't really happening any which ways, right? Now, what will also happen is that whatever little sales were happening, whatever little construction was happening, uh, things will get worse. Who will this impact? I mean, it will obviously impact the builder. It will impact uh, the bank from which the builder has taken on, 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 on a loan and so on. But it will also mean that informal jobs will get impacted. And informal jobs in the construction industry and the and, and agriculture sector amount for close to 85% of informal jobs uh, in this country. And many of these people get paid on a daily basis. So there, you know, the troubles might just uh, escalate. So these are a couple of thing, links that I could think of. And I'm sure there are many such links uh, out there. And, and, and they'll, they'll only gradually come out as, as we go along. Okay. Now, you know, solution kya hai? You know, this is something I, I get asked regularly on the social media, you know, being accused of uh, raising problems all the time and not giving solutions and so on and so forth. Now, you know, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, this, I think this, this tendency to ask for solutions over and over again, uh, basically comes from the way our examination system is structured. And, you know, when we write exams in schools and colleges, uh, every question has a right answer. Right. So, but, you know, economics is not like that. As I, you know, to give you a very simple example, if, you know, in, in mathematics, uh, there, there is, uh, the, there, there is an equation of a line where y is equal to mx plus c. So if you know the values of mx and c, you know the value of y. Uh, but economics doesn't work like that. Uh, so again, so to give you, uh, to give you a sense of what, uh, you know, is, is how the government and the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, uh, India Central Bank are trying to tackle this and why, you know, things are working and why things are not working. Now, the Reserve Bank of India has, like you know, any other central bank, tried to flood the system, uh, financial system with money. Uh, the idea, obviously, is to drive down interest rates, encourage banks to uh, lend more, encourage people to borrow and spend more, encourage businesses to borrow and expand more. And you know, all this feeds back into the economy, and the economic and you know, economic growth uh, recovers. Now, only if it was as uh, simple as that. 
so Shakti Kanta Das, the, the governor of the RBI, made a long uh, sort of speech on Friday, uh, which the, the, the basic point of it was he wanted, uh, you know, he wanted to encourage banks to lend, uh, which is what all RBI governors want at different points of time. Now, one of the things that he did not say in that speech, and you know, I can't blame him for it, uh, is the fact that non-food credit lending in 2019-20 grew at just 6.2%. This is a 26-year low. Okay, uh, The last time uh, non-food uh, credit growth lending was as slow was in 1993-94. Uh, this is also the third slowest in 60 years. If you look at data from 1960-61, uh, to 2020, 2019-20, uh, you will find that the slowest growth uh, in non-food credit was back in 1961-62, if I remember correctly. So this is the third slowest growth. What is non-food credit? Banks in India give a lot of loans to Food Corporation of India and other state procurement agencies to buy rice and wheat directly from farmers. Once you subtract this lending from the overall lending of banks, what remains is non-food credit, right? Uh, so basically uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that bank lending was already in a mess before uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, uh, came in. And uh, since then things have only gotten worse. Now, how do I know things have gotten worse? Uh, so basically, banks deposit their uh, excess reserve. Uh, sorry, the excess money with, which they have uh, with the RBI. Uh, the RBI pays a certain rate of interest to them on this, and this is called the reverse repo rate. So on February twentieth, the banks had deposited uh, thirty-nine thousand nine hundred eighty-three crore with the RBI uh, through the reverse repo window. By April eight. Uh, April 12th, this had exploded to 7,1699 crore, an increase of 1655%. As of April 16th, which is the last data point available, the total amount of money deposited by banks with the RBI under the reverse repo window stood at 6,99,312 crore. So the point is, I mean, the only reason I'm throwing all these, uh, uh, you know, big numbers at you is the fact that the RBI, is, uh, the, the banking system has enough money to lend, but it isn't. Now, uh, now the, what, what did the RBI do about it? What, 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 uh, doc, not doctor, Mr. Shakti Kanta Das did was uh, he cut the reverse repo rate. So he cut the reverse repo rate from around 4% to 3.75%. So basically, uh, the message he was trying to send to the banks is that, guys, you need to go out there and lend. Uh, and how he sort of, the, the incentive here was that the rate of interest that banks would earn uh, by parking their money with the RBI uh, has been deducted by uh, 25 basis points. So the, the point is, uh, but will, will, will the banks lend? And I think, you know, the banks uh, are are not going to lend and there are multiple reasons for it. The first reason for it is, and this is something that we seem to have forgotten, is that the bad loans rate of banks continues to remain very, very high. Uh, if you were to look at data for September 2019, which is the latest data available, uh, the bad loans rate of uh, the entire Indian banking system was at 9.3%. So which basically means that for every uh, 100, uh, sorry, 1,000 rupees of loans given by banks, 93 rupees haven't been repaid by borrowers for a period of uh, 90 days or more. And uh, uh, the bad loans rate for public sector banks was at uh, an even higher 12.7%. So the point here is that we are still paying for the uh, mistakes that we made by expanding banking credit after uh, the last financial crisis, which happened in 2008 struck. So once the, the, the financial crisis of 2008 started, uh, public sector banks were essentially encouraged to lend more. And during the process of doing this, uh, you know, they ended up giving loans to many uh, corporates who they shouldn't have. And those, uh, you know, those decisions are still haunting us. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the banks which had sort of uh, uh, 
bank rolled the economy uh, at when the last financial crisis happened are really not in a position to bank roll the economy as of now because that mess continues okay the other point that we need to understand is that there is a great deal of uncertainty right now uh, you know you and i and even even banks and bankers do not know how badly this is going to you know go so in that situation it makes sense for banks uh, to be conservative because you know ultimately uh, other than lending money it, the banks are also responsible uh, to the depositors for from whom they have borrowed money right uh, return of capital is more important than return on capital i mean if i were to use a very cliched phrase here also what has happened is that uh, you know as as i said bank lending was already at a 26 year low and uh, why was that the case that was the case because one uh, obviously people and businesses are not in the mood to borrow many businesses are not in the position to borrow and banks uh, if you look at uh, credit data very carefully are not willing to lend to corporates uh, the only part of the business which continues to be very very robust uh, is uh, is retail banking and the funny thing is that what will happen now is that uh, the pressure on retail banking will even will 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 go up and uh, i will not be surprised that uh, you know once the lockdown ends we will all be bombarded with uh, many more calls uh, from telemarketing agents or banks offering us credit cards uh, you know uh, consumer durable loans and personal loans and and vehicle loans and what not so there is a certain problem uh, with the indian banking system and it clearly is not the lack of liquidity or the lack of money to lend so the rbi can basically keep doing whatever it is uh, but i don't think it's going to make make much of a difference so uh, you know uh, so to sort of uh, summarize uh, this section at uh, the risk of uh, another cliche uh you know as the old saying goes you can take a horse uh, to the water but you can't make him drink so that is uh you know that is the long and the short of it the rbi can create all that liquidity that it can but uh, the question is whether the banks will lend or they won't and as of now it doesn't look like they lend uh so what's the way out of uh, all this again solutions now uh, you know in a situation where the private sector uh, uh, is not uh, sort of ready to spend uh, banks are not willing to lend uh, keens john minard keens we go back to john minard keens and, and the world goes back to john minard keens whenever there is an economic crisis uh, basically keens had suggested that the government should become the spender of the last resort in fact you know keens was uh, uh, unlike the economists of today he he was great at rhetoric and one of the points that he made was that the government should even go to the extent of digging holes and filling them up and the idea being that you know when workers were paid for digging holes and paying them up they'll sort of go out and spend that money and that would help businesses uh, consumer spending would revive economic uh, incomes would revive and the economy would uh, you know uh, sort of revive as well uh so the government is 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 working along those lines uh, it has decided to pay uh, rupees 500 per month into female janthan accounts for a period of 3 months uh, the total bill for this works out to 30600 crore uh, you know many people have been appalled at uh, the fact that 500 rupees is so low but you know you need to understand the fact that 500 rupees is 500 rupees more than 0 rupees right uh also i mean having said that uh, i feel that this wasn't really the time to have discriminated uh, between men and women and money should have been uh, should have gone into all janthan accounts and uh, so if if the government had sort of paid 1000 rupees per month for a period of 3 months the bill for that would have run to around uh, rupees uh, 1,14,240 crore Uh, what the government has also done is it has brought forward the payment to uh, the first installment of uh, PM Kisan uh, payments to be made under the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Employment Guarantee Scheme have been increased. Uh, the payments under uh, the scheme which were held up have also been released. Income tax refunds have been released. Some of you have got would have probably gotten your uh, refunds. uh i think the other important thing that the government needs to be doing right now is to be at and at all levels it should be clearing its outstanding bills very very uh, quickly and now this will put more money in the hands of people uh 
uh, food entitlements uh, made available through the public distribution system have increased have been increased over april to june uh, this is a good move and i think this needs to be extended at least till september because of the simple fact that the food corporation of india has massive uh, stocks of rice and wheat uh, so if you look at data as of march uh, 2020 the food corporation of india had around 585 lakh tons of rice and wheat when the when the requirement uh, was around 214 lakh tons so you know it it was obviously massively overstocked so the fci is clearly in a position to give away uh, some of this uh, uh, some of this stock and help uh, the country at large now another simple suggestion that i i sort of uh, which I, th uh, you know, which I think will will help quite a lot is a simple change in the goods and services tax. Now, for people who pay GST, uh, they will know that GST currently uh, is needs to be paid as you know uh, after uh, after an invoice is raised, irrespective of the fact whether the payment has been made by the customer or not. Now, obviously, people have found ways to go around this, but you know, given that if we all follow the law of the land, uh, so this uh, you know this needs to be changed where people uh, you know uh, need to uh, pay gst only once after the payment has been received so this will obviously help in blocking uh, sorry in in freeing up uh, a lot of working capital now in in all this uh, you know from whatever you know solutions which have which have been done uh, which have been implemented uh, the corporates are really not happy okay they have they have been a terribly unhappy lot uh, and you know given the fact that they are not really used to speaking their minds uh, uh, at least uh, not in the front, at least not in front of the government, not openly, uh, a lot of them have spoken their minds in the recent past. Uh, but what they forget is that, you know, corporate tax rates were only cut dramatically as late as last year. So it's not like, you know, the government hasn't helped them. Now, the funny thing is, and I find, I mean, I'm no socialist, I find it very, very, uh, you know, amusing that capitalists who otherwise want lesser government all the time, want to be bailed out by the government the moment they smell an economic crisis brewing. Now, uh, uh, and this is something I'd like to quote. Uh, this came from a gentleman called Niranjan Hiranandani. Uh, he's the president of the industry body of real estate developers, uh, Naridco, and the business lobby Asocham, or Asocam, or however you pronounce it. So uh, he, he said, we need stimulus of over dollar 200 billion. Okay, Dollar 200 billion, not rupees, please mark my words with an ability to go up to dollar 300 billion with dollar 100 billion provided immediately dollar 100 billion in 4 months and the last 100 billion in 8 months okay now let's just do some basic math here okay now this is uh, where it gets interesting now let's assume uh, you know 1 dollar is worth 76 rupees and 30 paisa now it's obviously a little more now but uh, you know this was uh, the value of the dollar on the day i did this calculation so so 200 billion dollar dollars amounts to rupees 15.26 lakh crore or 15.26 trillion 300 billion amounts to rupees 22.89 lakh crore uh, now to give you a sense of proportion the uh, the central government uh, hopes to earn rupees 24.23 lakh crore as gross tax revenue in 2020-21 now as you all would all know a certain pro proportion of these revenues needs to be shared with the state governments so the net tax revenue that the central government hopes to earn stands at 16.36 lakh crore and what hiranandani is demanding you know a minimum of is 15.26 lakh crore so you know it's safe to say that hiranandani basically wants the government to spend 100% almost 100% of its taxes or even more uh, in providing an economic stimulus uh, i mean uh, i can still understand where he is he, he was coming from but what surprised me more was even venture capital funded startups you know which have blown up a whole lot of money over the last few years wanted the government to pay 50% of their salary bills and contract wage bills for the period april to september i mean socialism is alive and kicking uh, airlines in india want to be bailed out because american government is bailing out american airlines and believe you me all this has just started now of course you know if, if the government started bailing out vc funded you know companies it will it will it will it will be a huge job now what really irritates me is when companies like uber which have close to dollar 10 billion cash on their books accept us to donate money to help its driving partners. I mean, it just irritates me no end. I mean, do they think that people are essentially idiots or what? Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, uh, so the point I'm trying to make is, and, uh, you know, as, as Dr. Raghuram Rajan wrote uh, in his, you know, uh, wrote a book in 2003 uh, with a gentleman called Lugi Zingales, and he, his, his book was called Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists. And this is precisely the situation to do so, where the government should not give in to exaggerated demands from corporates and try and put more and more money in the hands of people. Let money be put in the hands of people, let them decide what they want to do with it. Uh, also, uh, having said that, this comes with a, a, a you know a, one point that the government needs to figure out innovative ways of helping small and medium enterprises. Uh, why, uh, government needs to figure out viable ways. Of, uh, sorry, helping of sorry. the government needs to figure out innovative ways of helping viable small and medium in enterprises. Uh, Dr. Rajan had a very interesting proposal on this front in a recent column in, in the Times of India, wherein he said that the government should accept responsibility for the first loss in uh, incremental bank loans made uh, to an SME up to the quantum of income taxes paid by the SME in the last, in the past year. Now, uh, you know, the question is, uh, you know, everyone says the government should do this, the government should do that. And, but I still haven't found anyone uh, essentially telling us in, in reasonably good detail, except probably, uh, you know, Dr. Ratin Roy at NIPFP, who has ha made a few very interesting proposals, uh, that how and where is this money going to come from? Okay. Uh, so one of the proposals uh, that uh, Dr. Roy uh, has made is that, you know, the government should issue bonds uh, and these bonds will essentially keep paying interest uh, for an unlimited period of time, uh, even though the principal will never be repaid. So these are called consoles and are typically tend to be issued during wartime. Uh, now, uh, but the point is, you know, the Indian government uh, the, 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 is, is already very stretched on the financial front. Now, one of the points that I've sort of regularly made is that the, the real fiscal deficit and fiscal deficit is essentially the difference between what a government earns and what it spends in the Indian case is close to 10% uh, of the GDP. And this includes not just the fiscal deficit of the central government, which is reported to be at 3.8% of the GDP, but the fiscal deficits of the state governments, the, uh, the off-budget borrowing of the central government uh, and uh, the borrowings of the public sector. Now, what will happen this year is that tax collections will collapse, okay? And uh, as uh, TN Nainan wrote in his column yesterday in the Business Standard, the governments at the center and state will be lucky to get away with a 10 to 15% tax shortfall, which will mean a loss of up to rupees 5 trillion, which is again 5 lakh crore. So the fiscal deficit properly calculated will balloon to levels never seen in our history, certainly worse than the situation in 1991. And, you know, Nainan doesn't really write stuff just like that. So, you know, if it's, if, 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 if it's coming from him, one needs to take it seriously. Uh, Anand Narayan, Narayan, a professor at uh, the SPJN Institute here in Mumbai writes, on the back of sharply lower receipts, the total borrowing figure could go up to 16% of the GDP. So the government essentially finances the fiscal deficit by borrowing money. So what uh, Narayan is essentially saying is the fiscal deficit could go up to 16% of the GDP, which is, 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 is a huge, huge number. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the government doesn't have much of a leg room when it comes to money. Now, one thing that needs to be done very quickly is to postpone any trophy projects, like the building of the new New Delhi. I mean, that is not, this is not the time to do it. Also, uh, all the excess procurement of rice and wheat by the government through Food Corporation of India, which primarily helps the rich farmers, needs to take a backseat this year. And the money needs to be sort of deployed to fight the negative economic consequences of uh, COVID-19. Now, uh, so what, what has happened is that, you know, given the fact that the government is financially stretched, many people are now suggesting that the government should print money. Now, what that basically, the government doesn't print money, the RBI does. So the RBI prints money, buys government bonds and, you know, hands uh, over the money to the government. Now, if you're the kind, uh, you know, who learns his or her economics on Twitter, uh, you will see economists, a uh, few economists, and almost every stock market wala asking the government to print money and spend. Now, of course, this suggestion comes from what is happening in the Western economies and a very rudimentary reading of a new uh, sort of, uh, you know, a, a new part in, in economics known as the modern monetary theory. 
Now, why can't we just copy the West? Why can't we copy America is, is a question, you know, I get often asked on Twitter. Now, uh, uh, so I'll try answering this briefly, given that this is a complicated question. And, uh, and I mean, it's a different topic altogether. The problem with printing money in the normal scheme of things is that it can cause inflation, given the fact that more and more money chases the same amount of goods and services. Uh, but the danger of that happening right now is rather low, given the fact that uh, demand has crashed. And also, the, if you look at the capacity utilization rates of India's manufacturing companies, and this is during the period uh, October to December, which is the latest data available, it had crashed to an all-time low level. So there was, you know, demand was already low even before the COVID-19 crisis starts. So the, the chances of inflation due to money printing are rather low. Uh, so then the question is why should you know what should stop us the one thing that should stop us is the fact that there is a very good chance of a rating downgrade if the government decides to print a lot of money in order to spend now also we need to realize the fact that currently the indian rating is just on the border of being investment grade one downgrade will put us in the non investment grade leading to a lot of foreign money leaving our stock market as well as our bond market so this will lead to you know the rupee losing value against the dollar it will lead to bond yields going up it will lead to interest rates going up and it will generally make the macroeconomic environment uh, even more shaky which is something we need to avoid at this point of time as dr rajan writes uh, a ratings downgrade coupled with a loss of investor confidence could lead to a plummeting exchange rate and a dramatic increase in long term rates in this environment and substantial losses for our financial institutions also, and this is something that comes out of my easy money books, it is worth remembering that the American dollar has an exorbitant privilege which the Indian rupee doesn't. Okay? Uh, the dollar is looked at as a safe haven and the money keeps going back uh, to the US. In fact, uh, you know, something that I would like to share here was, I think in 2011, the, uh, one of the rating agencies, uh, Standard & Poor, uh, Poor's decided to downgrade America's AAA rating. Now, when America's AAA rating was downgraded, what that should have led to was that money should have, led America, uh, should have left America. In fact, what happened was exactly the opposite. You know, money left all parts of the world and went back to America. So as Urjit Patel recently wrote, the exorbitant privilege of the US dollar not only endures, it is reinforced during a crisis. So these factors essentially mean uh, that the government will have to be very careful with printing money as well as going overboard with borrowing it. Okay? Uh, the bad state of the Indian economy even before the COVID-19 crisis struck uh, will come back to sort of bite it or haunt it at least if not. Uh, long story short, people and businesses will suffer. This is a big crisis and the ability of the government to do much is extremely limited. In fact, to be very honest, whatever little they have done up until now has been, has, has been decent. Uh, except for the fact that, you know, the way they handled the entire migrant uh, crisis uh, without really thinking through the problem. Uh, anyone who suggests otherwise you know given that uh, you know that things will be fine in 6 months or whatever or acche din aane wale is essentially bluffing and uh, so i would like to you know end this uh, with 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 a couplet and i'd like to thank my friend uh, mohit for suggesting the right couplet and uh, this is by a poet called anjum anjum khalik and this is how it goes uh, so meri pyas ka dono taraf ilaj nahi so meri pyas ka dono taraf ilaj nahi pyas is thirst ilaj is uh, treatment medicine so meri pyas ka dono taraf ilaj nahi udhar ek samundar hai idhar idhar hai sara ne i got i got, I got it wrong. sorry so meri pyas ka dono taraf ilaj nahi udhar ek samundar hai idhar sarab hai now what it essentially means is uh, sarab is essentially a mirage so so basically, you know, one side there is there, there is the sea and on the other side there is a mirage. So things are equally difficult on, on both the sides. Uh, so, you know, this is what I had to say. I mean, I also had a section on personal finance, but given that we've sort of actually, you know, gone much beyond what we had, uh, you know, decided on, what I'll do is I'll try incorporating whatever I had to say on personal finance uh, while answering all your questions. So. 
just as an intervention, would you like to spend 10 minutes on personal yes, no, sir, I don't have a problem. Sir. I'll do ah, Vikram, should, why don't we allow him to spend 10 I'll minutes? Have quite a few questions on personal finance. Yeah. So, but let it be a structured... Uh, sure. Go ahead. Vivek, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, right. So again, you know, uh, if, if you've been sort of following me uh, on, on, on the social media or uh, been following my writing, I have... Uh, sort of given a few basic tips on what you need to do on the personal finance front. And uh, this is something that is true at any point of time. It's not just, you know, it's not just a crisis should let, you know, get you to do this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, and I think uh, which is, is, is one of the most important things is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we should all sort of, uh, you know, start building an emergency fund if we if we haven't already. And ideally, or rather, at least at bare minimum, it should be three months of uh, your expenses. And uh, if it's more than that, it's 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 even better. Now, you know, money. The thing with money is uh, saving money is it's not just about facing an emergency. It's also about making better decisions in life. You know, God forbid if you were to be fired in the months to come and you have some money in the bank, then you will be in a better position to sort of negotiate, uh, you know, your next job. And you don't have to take on the first job that gets offered to you because you have no money in the bank. Uh, the third thing that I would like to sort of, and this is a question that a friend recently asked me is, should he continue with his SIPs or should he pay uh, credit card, his credit card dues first? Now, obviously, in ideally, both things should happen. But uh, in a world where there is only so much money and different things need to be done, uh, I think the credit card dues need to be paid off first simply because, you know, the interest is higher than 20% per year and it just compounds at a very, very... Uh, rapid pace and before you know it you know the amount has uh, you know reached a level where uh, you know you will not be able to pay it hence it makes first you know it makes immense sense to pay off uh, your credit card debt also uh, again this is uh, a simple point prioritize uh, loans try to repay loans which have a higher rate of interest and you know i find it mind boggling that people have credit card debts people have personal loans and at the same time, they have money in their savings bank account, which is earning a, a rate of interest of now even less than 3%. So if you have money in your savings bank account, and if you have a credit card debt, if you have a personal loan debt, please repay it first. Uh, also, again, you know, asset allocation is very, very important in life. Many people have figured, you know, have started realizing the importance of the humble fixed deposit in the last one month as the stock market has crashed. So even though, you know, interest rates on FDs have fallen even further, it makes immense sense to have some amount of money uh, in your bank to sort of, uh, you know, uh, take care of a rainy day. Uh, also, the other thing with asset allocation is that money doesn't get, all your money doesn't get stuck in illiquid assets like real estate. Uh, so there are people who are, you know, who have a lot of money, but they don't have liquidity. So liquidity is equally important. Uh, in the months to come, uh, minimize your discretionary expenditure. And I mean, I say this uh, seriously as well as sarcastically. You know, I find a lot of people uh, get a lot of meaning in life by spending money. And, uh, you know, there are people who find meaning in life by traveling. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, how much is one mountain different from another or one sea beach different from another? You know, in the time to come, uh, discretionary expenditure will have to take uh, a backseat. Holidays will have to wait. Uh, mobile phones, you know, a 10,000 rupee mobile phone is has the same uh, features as a 30, 40, 50,000 rupee mobile phone. There is WhatsApp on both the phones and both the phones allow you to call. You can also uh, access internet on both the phones. So uh, uh, build a checklist of things you've spent your money on in the last one year. Download your bank statement, go through it download your credit card statement, go through it, scrutinize it very, very carefully. You will be surprised. Uh, and you know, you, when you realize that uh, a lot of th these things you really didn't need and, and people are already realizing that now that they've been at home for more than a month. Now I can see books all around me, you know, where I am and a lot of these books I'm never going to read, but it just felt so nice when I was buying them. So, uh, also there's no point in having, you know, half a dozen credit cards, debit cards, uh, the, the problem is, you know, more the number of cards you have, uh, more is the temptation to spend. 
and this is simply because the pain of spending plastic money is not the same as the pain of uh, spending cash and this is very well documented there's a lot of research behind this uh, uh, also, you know, if you really want to sort of uh, minimize uh, the money that you spend, it is best to carry cash around with you all the time. So even the even though the government and the banks want you to go digital, uh, cash has its uh, own uses. Uh, also, you know, this is something a lot of people don't tend to know. Uh, be careful uh, with the fact that, you know, you, you don't need to have your savings bank account and your credit card with the same bank because somewhere in the fine print, if you default on the credit card payment, you have allowed the bank to access your savings bank account. Now, of course, this is not to suggest that uh, people are trying to default on their credit card outstanding, but it's generally a good practice to follow. Uh, make sure that you have nominees on all your mutual fund investments, insurance policies and bank accounts. Also have details of all your investments and bank accounts on a sheet of paper or a word file. Tell someone in your family exactly where it is located. Now, this is something that I need to do. I haven't. Okay. Uh, now, this is something that I, I sort of, uh, you know, also mentioned in, 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 in what I said earlier that uh, bank credit growth has, you know, slowed down majorly in the last one year and, and it will slow down even more. So the retail loans, so the banks will, uh, you know, have put great pressure on, on giving out uh, more retail loans. And in the months to come, the sales pitch uh, of banks will get, uh, you know, better and you'll get more calls offering you personal loans, credit cards and so on. So try and resist uh, uh, the temptation. And I think finally, uh, what I'll say is be good to your parents, be good to your in-laws, be good to your siblings because they might have to either take you in or bail you out. Uh, also, be good to your spouse, because this is the time when you really need to work together as a team. And uh, I mean, as I said, remember, everything doesn't have a, have, have a solution. Just because, you know, the exam questions that we uh, answered uh, had one. So that's it. Thanks, Sajin. Thanks, thanks, Vivek. Thanks, Vivek. Before Vikram and Chandana take over, just wanted to say that about there were 330 participants I here thought. on this and there were about 200 parallel on YouTube. Great. So good participation and it was a terrific talk. Over to the moderators. Uh, Vivek, uh, thank you. I know that uh, complex issues cannot have uh, simple solutions, but they can have simple explanations. And I think that's what you achieved with the 500, 600 of us who are listening to you. And uh, I could relate to each one of your uh, explaining what's happening, even though I am not an economist. And I must thank you. For that. I am not an economist, though I claim to be one these days. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are uh, almost about 200, 250 questions, and obviously we can take everyone. Uh, we have chosen a few, and I uh, sure. crave the indulgence of the others if you cannot choose you. It's just because of lack of time, but we will definitely take all of you, uh, depending on how it. Uh, progresses. The first question I have from Tanmay Shetty is that uh, how is this distress selling of crops by the farmers currently going to impact the spending cycle? We already have a pretty bad rural economy and uh, how is it going to change the spending cycle and uh, has this been accounted when we were tracking GDP? See, the point is, uh, there are two things. One is, you know, it's, it's, uh, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence on this, right? Because all of us have read these uh, stories on how you know farmers have uh, basically had to dump tomatoes, grapes, and, and so on, depending on which part of the country they are in. Now, the problem is obviously there's no way to agglomerate and come up with a number as to these are the losses. The, the second thing is the, G, the GDP actually calculates the, the value of the production. Now, whether that production is selling or not is not a problem that uh, they concern themselves with. Uh, there is a question, I mean, two related questions. One is that, uh, yeah, how do you see India vis-a-vis -vis the global markets, especially with respect to what an anonymous attendee says, how will the Fed printing $2.3 trillion affect the Indian economy and the Indian stock market? And uh, what's happening in US cannot be ignored in India. And can you, can you just connect these two? So basically, see, uh, if the last that I looked at uh, Fed's balance sheet was last week, I need to, I mean, I needed to do it before this thing when I forgot. 
so the last that I checked, I, I saw that the balance sheet was at around a little more than six trillion dollars, and it had expanded by forty six percent in a very short period of around forty days. Uh, so what that tells you is that the Fed is printing money and buying bonds big time, uh, and they are on an unlimited money printing program, wherein the idea is to obviously print money, buy bonds. And pump that money into the financial system, drive down interest rates, and help people, you know, consume more and so on. And this is something which has been happening for the last 12 years. Now, what this has led to is, while you know, consumption etc. has improved a little, what it has done is that it has provided Wall Street with a lot of easy money, which they can borrow at rock bottom interest rates and invest in stock markets, bond markets, real estate markets all around the world. And that. Is something that now will 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 go up. Now the funny thing is, and there is very little data on this, you know, because it's just been happening for around 40 days, is that in the last 40 days, not a lot of that money has come into India. So it's probably gone into uh, you know the more developed stock markets. But my thing is, and I even wrote about this, uh, I think around a week back, that as if if the Fed is on an unlimited money printing program, and so you know there are other central banks also which are printing a lot of money. Some of it will eventually come. Uh, into India, at least in the short term, uh, you know the the stock market should look good. But you know this is at best a guess. You know, I mean, pre predicting which way uh, the market will go is 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 a mug's game. So, uh, actually, many people ask me this question, uh, and I want you to just take a small class for all of us. Uh, how is this printing money transmitted to the people? Can you just tell us? Yeah, sure. So basically, what happens is, see, nobody really prints money now. Okay, it is all created digitally. Uh, but the point is, when I say money is created digitally, it just doesn't have the same impact as saying money is being printed. Now, what I, you know, what what it means is that the Federal Reserve obviously has a computer somewhere wherein it sort of, you know, inputs something and the money supply goes up. Okay. Now, the, the thing is that how does the the government ensure that uh, this money essentially is pumped into the financial system, right? I mean, it cannot uh, sort of, you know, uh, take that money and throw it out of helicopters. I mean, that's not possible. So what it does is the, the, the Federal Reserve essentially buys bonds. Okay? It buys bonds from all kinds of market participants. And when it buys bonds, it pays them with this freshly created money, which is digital, which is largely digital. And then this, this, there's this money that sort of goes into the financial system. The money supply goes up. And because money supply goes up, uh, interest rates tend to come down. And when interest rates come down, you know, the hope is people will borrow and spend more. Businesses will borrow and expand more. So the integral part of this money expansion is ability of corporates and individuals to borrow from the banking system. And if right now the sentiment is weak, and people just don't want to borrow. Printing money may not have the same effect as what you desire. Yeah, of course. I mean, but then see, I mean, which is what, which is why I said, you know, macroeconomics at the end of the day, and especially if you look at monetary policy, has a very limited set of solutions. And most of these solutions ultimately boil down to the fact uh, that you know you sort of uh, 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 create a situation where interest rates come down and hope that people can, you know, people will borrow and spend more. See what also happens is I mean so I mean because we are talking let me just expand this a little bit. So uh, you know when 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 the Federal Reserve first started printing money in the aftermath of the financial crisis, the hope was precisely what I have explained. Right, people will borrow more, spend. Uh, companies will borrow more, spend, expand. Now people obviously there was a problem because they were already coming out of one round of borrowing binge, which had caused the you know financial crisis of 2008 because they borrowed to buy real estate and then. You know, burn their fingers there. So, uh, so there was a there was a gap of at least three to four years between when the Fed started to print money and when uh, people actually started to borrow money all over again. Uh, now, the funny thing is with corporates. Now, what happened with corporates is the corporates instead of borrowing money and expanding, what they did was they borrowed money and they bought back their shares. So when they bought back their shares, the number of shares in, 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 in available in the public domain in, in the market went down. And when, when the number of shares went down, the earnings per share went up. And in expectation of this, stock prices rallied. So essentially in the last, uh, you know, this has been happening for almost a decade. Uh, a lot of American companies have ended up borrowing a lot of money to drive up their share prices. Now the problem is now, and it's all haunting them right now because now they don't have cash on their books, and they are heavily leveraged, and in process 
they have to fire their employees so which is why if you if you look at uh, the unemployment rate in the us uh, some economists are now saying and, and this is you know the, the april numbers are not i mean will obviously come out at the end of april some economists are now saying that the the unemployment rate in the us is now higher than the great depression so as i said you know one is uh, you know there are no I mean, Uh, solutions can go uh, in unexpected directions and uh, yeah yeah right. uh, two more questions before i hand it over to the facebook uh, in, on facebook we are having a panel set of questions sure. and but just two more questions one is uh, shantasena asks uh, why not just cut defense expenditure stop buying planes stop building the new delhi parliament stop giving subsidies because in any case government is subsidizing in another form is that are there sources of cutting expenditure uh, and still be able to somehow balance the budget okay so if you look at india's defense expenditure over the years as a proportion of gdp it's actually come down so it's not like it's going up uh, so there is not and you know most of it is you you're paying salaries and you know stuff like that so you can't really cut uh, you know defense expenditure on that front uh the other thing is as i said yes uh, the this this entire new new delhi which is being built uh, that can take a back seat uh, uh whether it will i don't know uh, so there are there are areas i mean see i'm not an expert on this but i'm sure there are areas where expenditure can be cut one example as i said was uh, that you know the food corporation of india has ended up over buying rice and wheat over the years and you know uh, they don't uh, you know they buy rice and wheat and then they distribute it through the food distribution uh, through the public distribution system but the amount of rice and wheat that they 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 have been buying is is much more than what they need to maintain food security in the country so there's uh, you know so this one particular year uh, there can be a cut but then again uh, it's not politically feasible so uh, pradeepto chatterjee asks this question uh, the government of india has to my understanding to cash in on the public's mood suddenly started riding on the rhetoric of make in india push and stop chinese goods how do you see that thing played actually considering the botched up gst and the demo uh, in that context and the recent circular of okay land locked china investments i mean the neighboring this is you know this is a separate discussion in itself uh, what i would suggest is i mean i would i'll answer the question but what i'll also suggest is that the gentleman i re, i i wrote a piece in the mint a while back on why uh, protectionism is always a bad idea so i would suggest that he reads that okay. now to answer the question uh, you know what will happen is obviously you know there will be a lot of nationalism which will when it's already started to happen will which will take over the uh, debate and you know people will say stuff like we shouldn't buy from china and we should buy from india and encourage our own industries and stuff like that now there's nothing wrong with that the problem is that uh, you know so here here is how how it is so why do you think people are buying stuff from china okay no one's forcing them right people are buying stuff from china because quality is good things are available at a better price vis-a-vis what is available in india okay so value for money so no one's forcing anyone to buy stuff from china so the question is can we produce at at uh, you know a same quality product at the chinese price no Uh, so if we start producing uh, in india uh, by sort of blocking chinese imports what will eventually happen is the prices of things will go up okay now when prices of things will go up people will prioritize right so if you buy something you will not buy something else so at the end of the day net net the impact on the indian industry will not be the same uh, will uh, the indian industry will will remain the same because uh you know people uh, will end up paying more for products and in that process they'll end up cutting down on their exp- you know if they buy one thing they'll not buy something else so you know the the idea sh- is should not be to sort of cut down uh, on chinese imports and stuff like that the idea should be to become more productive in india so you know before make in india we need a pro- you know something like be productive in india which is currently missing and which then goes back to our age old debate of our infrastructure and our land laws and our labor laws and our banking system and and the way the government treats businesses so see the, the problem with the average indian politician is that he does not trust business okay uh, when it comes to doing business but when it comes to needing money to finance the political system he is perfectly fine so then we are getting into broader philosophical issues which really do not have straight forward answers so uh the keeping in policy of uh, manthan smarter people should deal with facebook now chandra at your turn 
Well, uh, Vivek, there are lots of questions also on YouTube, so we won't be able to take all the questions. I've uh, chosen a few. Uh, there is one, I think, which is on the minds of a lot of people. I know you've uh, spoken about this, but even then, a reiteration would be good. This is sure. from uh, Dr. Rajiv uh, Nair. He says, my retirement corpus has been dented by 30%, which was an equity-oriented yeah. MF. Uh, now, with about six, seven years to go for cessation of professional income, should I stay invested or exit to FD, etc.? If so, when to exit? A uh, related question is uh, from Lakshmi Narayana. What's your call on investment in gold in future? So, uh, you know, to first answer the question of gentlemen approaching retirement, I think I'd, uh, uh, Ajay had sh shared this question uh, last night and I was thinking about it. See, the, the, the problem is, which is why I said, you know, asset allocation is very, very important. So when, when, if you are approaching retirement and as you approach retirement, your, your, your uh, investments in equity should sort of uh, come down and your investment in fixed deposits, etc. should go up. But given that, you know, the gentleman has not done that, and I really don't have a straightforward answer for this, but what I think he, he, he can be doing is that in the years to come, uh, the, the fresh investments need to be made more on the, on the bank deposit side and, uh, and hope, you know, and pray that the stock market recovers and, and, and he recovers his losses because, you know, I really don't have a straightforward answer for that. Uh, gold, you know, I've always been a believer in gold uh, for the simple reason that uh, gold is essentially a metal which helps us uh, hedge against uh, what our governments do. And uh, but again, I mean, having said that, you can't bet your life on gold because you know it's a very volatile asset class, goes up and down very fast, doesn't move for years at end. But in the scenario that we are in currently, you know, gold is an excellent. Uh, you know, play on uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the rupee will sort of lose value against the dollar uh, simply because gold, you know, we produce very little gold in India and, uh, you know, gold is primarily bought and sold internationally in dollar terms. And the fact that, uh, you know, every government in the world is printing money. So, you know, by that very uh, thing, a lot of people are investors are moving to gold in order to hedge their portfolios. So gold should be a part of your portfolio, but it's not, I mean, you can't bet, you know, you can't be investing 100% or 50% or even 30% of your money in gold. I mean, at best 10 to 15%, even at the upper end of your portfolio can be gold. So. Another question from Uzramma. How can the banking system be made more democratic and accessible to small borrowers? Oh, Bob, this is <laughs> PhD topic in itself. Uh, I don't know. I really am not. Uh, I mean, this, uh, I mean, I don't have an answer for it. Sorry. Uh, we'll uh, move to the next question. It says, uh, uh, Srishti asks this. We usually talk about daily wage earners, farmers. Of course, they are uh, going to suffer. But uh, the most suffering set will be the lower middle class, those who earn between 10,000 and 15,000 uh, a month. How are they expected to manage? So as I said, you know, the, the aim of the different governments all across the country should be to put money in the hands of, uh, more and more money in the hands of people. Now, obviously, the, the problem is how do you clearly target a certain section of the society? Uh, currently, our systems can't, uh, are not, uh, you know, structured to do that. Uh, so the, the only thing you can obviously do in this scenario is essentially to, you know, as I said, to put more and more, more money in the hands of uh, people. And then, you know, uh, you know, you should, you know, uh, it also depends on, uh, you know, where these uh, low and middle class people are employed. So uh, it is, uh, I guess it's, it's up to the middle class now which employs these people as, you know, as drivers, as maids, as cooks to treat them well and not sort of start, you know, just because they have, you know, I mean, they don't sort of work for a month or two, you start docking their salaries and people are doing all that. And uh, I mean, this is something that, you know, there is no, uh, I mean, there is no government level so solution, but the solution needs to emerge at a societal level where uh, we need to be doing as, as a society, we need to be doing the right thing. So. Whether we do it or not, I don't know. So. A related anonymous question is, do we have to pay salary for the lockdown period or can we adjust the number of days lost by working extra on future Sunday holidays, etc.? I mean, if you can, are in a position to pay, you should pay. I mean, I understand that a lot of businesses are stretched and, you know, cash is a problem and money is not coming in. 
uh, and I don't want to, I mean, I'm not the kind who sort of uh, believes in, you know, the government making it mandatory. Like, I mean, there was, a, I think there was a re recommendation by the Maharashtra government a couple of days back that landlords should not take rent. It was a recommendation. I mean, they, they didn't have any way to implement it. But even a recommendation, you know, I, I mean, every landlord is in a different situation. There are landlords whose uh, houses run on money which comes from rent. There are landlords who are paying EMIs out of it. So I think this is something that has to be left to the society at large to negotiate and uh, figure out an answer to. I don't think any government intervention is going to help. So, Onindu to Ghosh writes, could reducing uh, inequalities through taxing the super rich and redistribution of wealth be a way to increase necessary consumption for the uh, poorer half and reduce avoidable, unsustainable consumption of the upper middle class and rich? This is a dream that people have. This is a dream that people have had for many years. This is a dream that Jawaharlal Nehru had. This is a dream that Indira Gandhi had. Uh, it's not possible. Uh, for the simple, I mean, look at, uh, you know, how things were before 1991, okay? In, and I can give you an example here. I think it, it was in the budget speech of 1970 or 1971. I don't remember the exact year. Yashwant Rao Chauhan, Chauhan, who was the finance minister at that point of time, uh, essentially introduced a, a highest marginal tax rate of 97.75%. So, which basically meant that if you were earning more than 1 lakh rupees during that course of that financial year, anything over nine, uh, uh, 1 lakh would be taxed at 98%. So, the, the moment you come up with these atrocious tax rates, all you're doing is, is driving the economy underground. I think the a better idea is to essentially make our tax system more simple, encourage people to pay taxes and... Uh, and, and 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 then go about it. I mean, this you know this idea about taxing the super rich, and I mean, I think it's 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 rubbish. And uh, and and you know, the super rich have all kinds of options. You know, they don't need to continue staying in India. They can move to Dubai. They can move to so many other countries in the world, which would be happy to give them a citizenship at a very very basic minimal uh, uh, payment. And uh, so, high tax rates are always a horrible, terrible, bad idea. Rishin Panchal asks, after the lockdown, can you tell us in detail about the sectors that would be the most affected? And uh, the second question also related to uh, Mohit Kabra writes, what can small businesses do to save themselves and what people in general can do uh, to get the e economy going? Uh, I forgot the first question. Okay. Uh, after the lockdown, which are the sectors ah, okay. that would be most? So I think, uh, you know, some of the uh, sectors, uh, the the service sectors will be badly impacted, uh, multiplexes, uh, hotels, uh, restaurants, uh, retail chains, you know, anything which there, you know, some sort of social isolation needs to be practiced. Uh, then there are obviously uh, discretionary items, uh, which people will not, I mean, people will postpone buying uh, cars, two wheelers, homes, all this kind of uh, stuff. And uh, I think Banking will also take a beating given that uh, there will be more and more defaults. The one thing that hadn't happened with Indian banks up until now is that uh, the retail default rates were very, very low. And that, I think, will definitely pick up. Uh, what businesses, small businesses can do, uh, you know, I'm really not uh, the right guy to answer that. What I can and you and I can do is, is basically essentially be careful with the way we spend our money, try having you know, fund for the rainy day, as I said. On a related question, uh, uh, there's a question here from Krishnan saying that uh, could the merger of the banks, what, what the impact and could it have been postponed because they'll now be distracted by the reasons of organization. Whereas yes. it's I agree 100%. In fact, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I think mergers of public sector banks are uh, in itself a very bad idea. Uh, and I mean, for all the spin around it, it's basically the only reason the government is doing it is to essentially hide the you know, worst banks uh, with banks which are doing a little better. So it's like Dena Bank, which had a bad loans rate, if I remember correctly, of around 22%, being merged with uh, Bank of Baroda, which had a bad loans rate of 12%, and Vijaya Bank, which was actually a pretty decently performing government bank and had a bad loans rate of around 6% or 7%. Yes. So it's a bad idea, and it, it I think the the, uh, the recent merger should have been postponed because you know merging, you know one organization is difficult. You're merging four organizations, 
into one organization and it, it needs a certain amount of managerial bandwidth time and this is not the time to be i mean this is the time to sort of you know figure out banks to figure out you know which are the loans it should be giving which are the loans it should not be giving rather than get stuck with all these administrative hassles uh, you know related to a merger so in in, the, in that context then do we we will stop discussing about this bad bank uh, creation is it i mean because there is a concept that we should have created a bad bank shifted all nps there and continue with life uh so this is um, i mean see i have a book coming up in fact my book bad money which is a book on banks Uh, would have released on april 13th uh, but i mean obviously it did not so there is a long section where i discuss this and i am not a great fan of uh, you know see what you're doing is essentially moving uh, bad loans from one public sector entity to another public sector entity now the incentives in the public sector whether it is a good bank or a bad bank continue to remain the same so uh, it wouldn't have worked yes sir Sorry. yeah So Vignesh Subramaniam writes: Even if we all get back to normal and all businesses are open, will India be particularly affected given the mismanagement at all levels during the crisis, similar to demonetization? So, what is the question? The question is about misgovernance and uh, mismanagement. Will that not affect even if things were to get back to normal? Is it going to be hunky dory? you know that is a given right i mean that's not something that has changed or uh, is likely to change so so yes i mean so the factors that have sort of impacted us badly uh, with you know uh, when it comes to the limited state capacity of our governments will continue to impact us now i mean look at the entire uh, uh, you know look at the entire uh, this this entire debate around the lockdown right now why is you know every government uh, so much in favor of a lockdown i mean obviously you know if you if you think at think of it from an incentive point of view it makes sense for every government to continue with the lockdown because no politician wants to be accused of you know lifting the lockdown and then suddenly the rate of uh, you know people dying due to covid-19 going up but that part is understandable but even without that i mean the the reason that every government wants to extend the lockdown is because our public health infrastructure is 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 absolutely in the pits and and there is no way that it is in a position to you know take uh, you know if if these num- if the number of cases spike there's no way uh, it can handle it in fact there was this story in i think in, in the mumbai mirror today wherein uh, a person uh, right here in worli where i am who had a you know who had who was having trouble breathing was taken to eight different uh, hospitals and uh, all of them refused him uh, you know uh, refused to take him in and he died so i mean so this is i mean we're barely starting so there is a question here uh, which says that this vivad vishwas scheme uh, where the government has uh, after all government has not budgeted for input from that scheme don't you think that this is the time when they should give a higher discount and then go ahead with the scheme like that a uh, tricky question i mean i am never in favor of these kind of schemes for the simple reason that they hurt in the you know they hurt in the longer term in the sense that you are essentially telling the person who's paid uh, his taxes regularly and rightfully over the years that you know you've been stupid uh having said that yes i mean the need of the r is to sort of look at things innovatively and if this brings in uh, some amount of money uh then so be it i mean because the government is going to need lots and lots of money i mean as you know as nainan said uh, wrote in his piece uh, the taxes are going to fall by 5 lakh crores at you know once you take both central and state governments into account so yes but i think that that all that will start to happen once uh, you know they they start to relax the lockdown because they will need money you know from wherever it wherever they can you know raise it so so ramara sorry good yes sir good uh, ramara veluri writes referring to your uh, baba analogy what is the effect on public transport will cycles make a comeback not only because of covid related issues but also to ensure saving by the middle class whose jobs are at stake if people can walk 300 kilometers then surely some can cycle 15 kilometers per trip will what will make a comeback cycles cycles <laughs> i mean you know you have you seen indian roads i mean you can't even walk 
where will you cycle? I mean, the chances of you being knocked down in the first week of your cycling itself are so high that right, cycles are not going to make a comeback. Don't worry about that. So, there is a question from Saira Mocherla. What is the estimate of the government, state, and federal contractual dues to corporates as well as refunds due? And what's the possibility that government will now establish a separate line of credit offering financing against security of such uncontested dues? Obviously, the government owes a lot of money to corporates. Uh, I'm sure to discounts and various. Uh, yeah. yeah. And they so, don't pay. To be very honest, I haven't seen a overall number anywhere. And I don't know. But it will obviously, it runs into a few lakh crores. That is easy to say. Now, whether they'll uh, sort of uh, set up a separate financing line where, you know, you're allowed to sort of uh, discount these. I don't know. I mean, this is something only a, uh, only Miss Nirmala Sitaraman can tell us. Or someone okay. secretly oh, in, uh, in the finance ministry bureaucracy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, then, is there any, uh, also central government is, Announcing schemes, but actually they are not transmitting money to the state governments. So, because is there a consequence of this central government delaying? Yeah, I mean, see, that's what I said. You know, the central government is 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 stretched as of now, and uh, uh, you know, tax collections have fallen, and and which is why the RBI has increased the ways and means advances, which the central government uh, you know now has access to. So. Uh, I don't know. I mean, so these are administrative questions. I mean, why why they are not transferring money? I mean, that only the central government can answer. I mean, I really don't have a straightforward answer for that. So, uh, I have a question, Vivek. Sure, Vikram, I think. Vikram, may I? Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, at a time of crisis, uh, sometimes uh, you know, states and organizations make major changes into how how they behave. Right. which is uh, something what happened in 1991. Right. Uh, do you think at this time of an extreme crisis, it will trigger the state to understand the importance of state capacity, of structural changes right into how governance is done and uh, things like that? Because without all that, uh, is, these are all going to be incidental uh, peripheral changes. 100%. I mean, I agree with you now. Uh, these changes are required. Uh, whether it will happen, yeah, I, I really don't know. You know, governments really don't 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 change, and they don't change very quickly. So let's say, I mean, six months down the line, I might probably be saying a different thing. Uh, but as of now, I really don't see any change, any major change happening. Yes, yeah, and and isn't there a serious issue of uh, absence of talent today? Talent in the government? In the government? Uh -huh, of course. I mean, but then, I mean, you know, it's very difficult to work with these uh, guys. So. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> okay. Mohit Kabra writes, the negative effects on economy will be felt for years after we conquer COVID-19. How can we get out of the neg negative feedback loop, loop once there is a cure or vaccine or herd immunity for COVID-19? I mean, see, see these, what, what happens is that, you know, economies eventually uh, heal themselves. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very tricky question to answer. Now, you know, the thing is that uh, the, the way to sort of get out of this crisis is essentially to uh, ensure that anyone who uh, has a, a certain entrepreneurial spirit uh, inside him needs to be encouraged to go ahead and become an entrepreneur. Because, see, it's, it's very, very straightforward. You know, big companies uh, do not, I mean, they create jobs. But the maximum number of jobs are created when the smaller companies grow into bigger companies. Now, the, if, you, if you look at, uh, you know, data in the Indian case, we have lots and lots of small companies. But these companies are companies which employ less than 50 people, okay? So companies start small, they continue to remain small. Then we have companies which are which employ more than 250 people. There is a huge gap in between. You know, companies which employ from 50 to 250 people, we don't have. Now, these are the companies we actually need. These are the companies which create jobs. And these are the companies, you know, which essentially, uh, you know, when they create jobs, they uh, employ uh, people and they, you know, then they get paid and then people go out and spend money and, and this is what is, is the demographic dividend, the so-called demographic dividend is all about. So you essentially need to encourage people who are entrepreneurial to execute their ideas and 
let them do it in you know the way they want to do it without trying to create a problem for them at you know every second thing that they want to do so there's an interesting question here from ravi shankar uh what are some permanently economically important changes in work and life times that you foresee in the post covid world so i mean so this is a you know it's 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 a fairly philosophical question and but one thing that i can clearly see is that uh, a lot of companies will now realize that they really don't need a physical space uh, a big physical space where everyone can come and work and in a way it's good because you know the way are at least in an indian context because the way our cities are our infrastructure really cannot handle people traveling to and fro from work on a daily basis so uh, you know you i see more and more people uh, wherever it's possible i mean obviously you know <coughs> areas like manufacturing and construction all this is not possible but anyone who sort of needs a computer to uh, work uh does not need to go to office so give you a very simple example banks have wealth managers okay who work out of uh their you know premises now a wealth manager need not come to office every day i mean he can go meet his clients uh and then go back home so this is 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 one big change so what what this will do obviously is one is the demand for commercial real estate uh, will go down which is which obviously is not good Uh, but what it will also do in a good way is that <coughs> it should do is is that people will have more time on their hands i mean you know in a city like bombay if if you're walking anywhere in central mumbai or south mumbai and staying uh, either in the western or the central suburbs uh, or even if you're cross criss crossing from the western suburbs to the central suburbs you know you end up spending 3 hours during the day just traveling you know 3 hours out of 16 17 hours that you know of time that you have so 20% of the time traveling in an environment which is not pretty feasible i mean so that is a good thing so i mean in in uh, so uh, you know if 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 i was in bangalore and uh, if i were to crack a joke uh, basically the silk board junction jam would disappear i mean you know in bangalore they have this silk board jokes so we no we will we'd no longer have those jokes so i know there's a tongue in cheek question from shobhit What about five trillion dollar economy by twenty twenty four? Yeah, I mean, what do you want me to say? <laughs> so, I mean, it's not happening. Yeah, five trillion, obviously, will. I, I think that five trillion dollar economy doesn't affect India anymore. Maybe that's what. It no, I mean, it's like see, it can. I mean, see, the the, the trick, the thing is that obviously we'll we'll reach five trillion someday, but that's not. Uh, it's not going to be two thousand twenty four for sure. So. P. V. Shivaram writes, Econ uh, "Economics can be looked in isolation, as explained very well. Talk appears to have focused on factors within India. What about impact of goings on on a global scale on our economy? Impact of what? Uh, the global scale. What's going on at the global scale? Impact of that on our economy? Okay. I mean, see, I mean, when when a crisis is global, obviously the impacts are global as well. So you know, uh, clearly." Uh, uh you know uh, so one of the things that that that's happening now and everyone's talking about it and uh, is is the fact that companies will look to get out of china okay mm -hmm. now so this is obviously a good opportunity for us but the question is will these companies come to india or not now uh, you know if if you if you look at uh, how uh, you know the chinese labor costs have, have been going up over the years and in the last few years a lot of entrepreneurs have moved from china to other parts of the world i mean they've moved to vietnam they've moved to bangladesh but they haven't really come to india so uh, i mean the question is will they come to should they come to india yes but will they come to india i mean we can we can debate on that so so there is an opportunity for us in the crisis uh, the question is are we in a, you know are we ready to uh, cash in on it because this opportunity has been there for the last 4 5 years in fact i remember that uh, arvin subramanyam when he was the chief economic advisor even wrote a detailed uh, uh note on it so there is a very interesting question i mean uh, shankar narayan asks this question uh what is the environmental impact and does this crisis have good news uh i'm sure you are aware that uh, delhi has now reported a whatever the number is from 25 when it was 450 all these days so maybe it's all interconnected and maybe no, it is no, no, 
Yeah, yeah, of course it is. I mean, as I said, as the economy itself, you know, various factors are interconnected. I mean, then, you know, the economy is also connected to the environment in that way. Yeah. So, the, you know, the air we are breathing is clearly much better. But then at what cost? Right. I mean, you can't, I mean, as my father used to tell me, you can't just survive on love and fresh air. Right. I mean, you need money at the end of the day as well. So, yes. So, the, the, the point again is that, you know, uh, when we go back to a normal sort of scenario, I mean, uh, will the pollution continue to, the, the fall in pollution continue to remain the same? No. But the question is, will it go back to the previous levels, right? Now, that again depends on how, uh, you know, how the work environment evolves, whether people continue, uh, uh, I mean, using cars and, you know, stuff like that as much as they used to. And I mean, so that is, I mean, that remains to be seen. So. A question from Arjun: Is it time for? Is it a good time for land and labor reforms? It is always a good time for land and labor reforms. <laughs> it's never, it's never a bad time to reform. Yeah. And uh, of course, Khalid writes: Don't you think that the government should now now realize that they have to get around to real governance instead of playing silly childish games? Ah. Uh. No, but do you think that's happening? So. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Okay, there's another question here, I mean, which is, I'm, I'm sure we don't have an answer, but I still yeah. need to ask the question. Sure. Times of economic pressure and where we are, expenses are coming down, income is coming down. Will corruption come down? Will corruption come down? Okay. Uh, but why should corruption come down? I mean, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, probably the payments might come down. <laughs> Why should corruption as such come down? So, I mean, obviously, corruption will also be impacted. You know, when times are good, people who are corrupt also make... Uh, I mean, it's, it's very simple. You know, when, when there are more and more land deals happening, okay? I'll give you a very simple example. When times are good, there are more real land deals happening. There are more... Uh, there's more real estate being built. So, obviously, politicians and bureaucrats make more money. But when times are bad and when, you know, real estate deals are not happening and when more homes are not being built, and I mean, there is an equal impact. I mean, economy, if, if the economy goes down, uh, corruption in, uh, you know, when it comes to the total amount of money being earned also comes down. But I guess as a proportion of GDP, it probably stays the same. So, yeah, okay. so the, I, I'll be getting the same favor for a lesser amount of bribe. But then see, you, you obviously, you also have to take into account the fact that the, econ the economy is also not growing at the same pace. So as a proportion of the economy, probably corruption continues to remain the same. I think Vivek, uh, uh, there are a flurry of questions, but then we cannot solve the world's problems. But we, we have, we've got a terrific, terrific perspective of what, you, uh, what you're saying and then the questions are very, very engaging. Uh, uh, Ajay, I think I, I hand it over to you, but I just want to tell people that on Friday evening, we are going to have a long talk by... Uh, V. Lakshmikant on work and life, uh, working from home off and his own experiences. He's the CEO of Broadridge. That's on Friday evening. Then we have uh, Mrs. Usha Thoret on Sunday morning at the same time to talk to us about uh, the economy in the post-COVID world. Ajay, it's your turn. 